Hopefully this detection grew screening. It is my honor to introduce to you Scott Harnsler. So, psychiatrists tell you that uh, the fear of public speaking uh, is greater than the fear of death. <laughs> so, the fact that you've got a survivor giving a public address, the irony is not lost on <clears throat> So, as we get started, I'm not a public speaker, I need to say that in advance. And uh, some important yes, things to know when I get nervous, I get chatty. And I try and be funny. Typically unsuccessful. So we're gonna go, you're gonna see a lot of that tonight. So, um, but I'm looking at this like a team event type thing. So my point is, is that the more you drink, the better I sound. So I, I heard somebody say something like, like something like challenge on or something like that. So I'm going through my cancer story. There's a couple of things that are important to know. Um, the first is that I was raised by two loving parents that instilled some very key things in me. And one is the faith of my father and dad, that he loves me and has got for me. I don't always know what it is, but I know he's got one for me. Uh, the second is that I can do anything if I put my mind to it. Another thing that might be valuable to note is that I'm a healthcare professional. Uh, I was an EMT, road ambulance, psychiatric nurse, ICU nurse, medical technology. The last 20 years I've worked inside technology where I look at stats. I look at things that uh, identify how we work with chronic disease and what we can do to diagnose chronic disease earlier so that we can have a better success rate at the end of that. It's population health, but that's my specialty. Um, so some of the statistics, if uh, we can get the slide up. So some of the statistics that are important to note, those are born in 1990. These are the types of stats that I work with. Um, those that are born after 1990 are double the risk for colon cancer. Um, Kentucky ranks third in the nation. For I also have four wonderful sons. That's right, four wonderful sons. So you notice the bald hair, the slightly glassy look. That is not from chemo. <laughs> But uh, as I go through my story this evening, I'll talk a lot about the what of what I went through. But it's most important to recognize the why. My belief is that with any what, or with any, with the right why, we can get through any what. This is my why. My friends, my family, my love for my Heavenly Father. Those are the most important things. So, um, anyway, in my life, I've been relatively healthy. Uh, no disease. I haven't gone to the doctor much. I mean, I'm fat, but I'm a healthy fat, right? Um, so um, back in the summer of 2017, I uh, started to get the, the, common, the, the common symptoms of cancer, colon cancer. Uh, I had challenges with my bowel. I had uh, some, some other issues that were going on. And the problem with this was that it happened literally a couple of days, or the onset of it was a couple of days after we went to Europe and France. And we were out in kind of the country of France, and so I thought, well, this is probably some type of change in my diet that's causing this. And uh, after a few months, obviously, we come back from France. And after a few months, I'm like, well, it's not that. It must be IBS. It must be parasite. It must be something else. Because I'm this healthy guy. I'm strong. I can overcome anything. It's not something big. I even went to the doctor a couple of times and said, there's something going on with me. And uh, he said, you know what? You, you haven't hit the age criteria yet, and you have no history of colon cancer in your family. So chances of it being something serious is fairly slim. Okay. So about a year into this, my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer, stage 2C. And um, so because I'm a healthcare professional and I'm focused on how to minimize the risk when certain things come up, I continued treating my gut issues with yogurt and probiotics. So, <laughs> yes. I wish I were kidding. So, a year later, I was on a business trip to Dallas, and uh, I had a, I passed a big blood clot, uh, like a really big blood clot, um, like a 
blood clot size we shouldn't be talking about over dinner. And it freaked me out. I, uh, I scheduled an appointment immediately with a GI doc. I was just done. And, uh, and to get me in, they told me that I couldn't meet with the doc, but I could meet with the PA. And so I went in and I talked with them. They scheduled a colonoscopy for about a week and a half out. During that time, I had another trip down to Dallas. And on that trip, or as I'm going to the airport, park and go to the uh, elevator, and I'm running to the elevator and somebody holds the door for me. And so I jump on and you know, you've got those like 90 second friendships. You start sharing information that you typically don't share with other people, but it's only for 90 seconds. So we find out that both of us are in the healthcare profession. So now it's no longer gonna be like a 90 second friendship. This is like seven minutes while we're gonna get through security. <laughs> and we start talking and I find out, well he finds out that I'm a technology guy inside healthcare. And I find out that he's a GI doc. And I'm like, this is awesome. Hey, you know, I'm gonna go see the GI doc on Friday to get my colonoscopy. And he says, really, who is it? And I know that this doesn't sound like it's a trick question, but when you're waking up earlier in the morning, early in the morning and you've not met your GI doc, it's kind of tricky. And I'm like, I don't know. He's <laughs> Hopefully he's good. <laughs> so we continue talking. He asked if, he asked if I'd like to participate in it as a technologist in helping to reduce colon cancer. And I, this is the type of thing I'd love to do. So I say, sure, I'd love to. We get through security and as we're parting, he, I turn to him and say, can I get your card? And he says, yeah. And I pass it to him and I look at it. It says, Whitney Jones. <laughs> I'm like, the Bravo is right. And I look at it for a second and I'm like, hey Whitney. Yeah. Is your PA's name Emily? <laughs> yeah. I'm coming to see you on Friday. <laughs> I was like, this is awesome. At least we know he's good. <laughs> so, awesome foundation story for a friend chat. Mm -hmm. So, Friday comes around and I go in for a call. And I got to tell you, I've never been knocked out before. I've never been um, sedated. And most people might see that as a little bit nervous. I was looking at it as a challenge. You know all these guys, like the spy movies, are like fighting and everything? That was me, truly. So they roll me over and the uh, I'm looking at these machines with all these digital outputs and everything, like monitoring machines. And I hear the anesthesiologist say, um, he says, listen, you're gonna start getting sleepy, so what I'd like you to do is to count backwards from, and that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> I'm an incredible lightweight. I wake up and I, I'm looking at the ceiling. And I've got this song going on in my head. So I look over and my wife is sitting over there, beautiful wife sitting over there, and uh, I say, is I singing while I was unconscious? She says, no. I said, are you sure? She said, yeah. I said, okay. Well, I really felt like I was singing Sweet Caroline from the Royal Island. She says, you weren't singing. But was it loud enough to? Because I'm really embarrassed. So, you know, listen, I'm taken, married, ladies, back out. <laughs> so Whitney comes in after this, after after my singing ordeal, and uh, he's very straightforward about things. And he says, Scott, exact words. He says, Scott, you have cancer. It sucks, but we're going to beat it together. For me, that's exactly what I needed. I wanted and appreciated this, the direct statement. Give me a path forward, let me know what's going on, give me a path forward and then partner with me. And that's exactly what happened. Now, Whitney, if I didn't have anything else important to say tonight, it would be worth standing up in front of all of these people and being as nervous as I am to tell you, you saved my life. Okay. You know, of other people, but for me, it's phenomenally personal. Thank you. Yes. So, what he found was a 10 centimeter max. So, I'm like, for the first 24 hours, I'm really calm. 10 centimeter max, that's tiny, right? Here's a hint. Americans are not good with the metric system. <laughs> so, if anybody had a, I was supposed to bring my phone up here and say, Siri, what is 10 centimeters and inches? And then Siri says, that's 9.4, and I'm, that's huge. That's the biggest of softball. So I have this softball inside my gut that's trying to kill me. Um, so now it's time to freak out for a little bit. Uh, everyone faces the freak out differently. My way was to rely on faith. So rely on my family, rely on my faith. Um, 
I have people from my church come over, a church leader comes over and prays with me. Well, when he prays with me, he says, Scott, there's something that you're going to learn from this. You need to learn it, and you're going to learn it before this ordeal is done. And so I immediately start, like, journaling. That's my method. I, and it, I, some people are very public, or some people are very private about the way that they address cancer. Some people are more public. I'm, like, publishing. And I'm like, <laughs> dear Facebook. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so this is my very first journal entry. It's about cancer, and it was ironically during No Shave November. I've been practicing No Shave November for several years. This time, I had skin in the game. So I figured, uh, if I'm going to learn something, then all four of my followers on Facebook, they're going to learn it too. <laughs> Here's the key lesson that I learned. Bad news does not get better with age. Treatment is easier when you start it early. Get screened early. So, now, cancer means surgery. I've never been through surgery before. I'm nervous now. I spend a lot of time reflecting on the things that are important to me. Um, my wife, my kids, my family, my friends. It changes your focus. You know, you have this life-changing diagnosis and it changes your focus. So, my next journal entry. Uh, when I get the diagnosis, I, you have to focus on what matters. That's what I do. Now, when I have the diagnosis, I have a couple of really big fears. Oddly enough, death was not one of them. What I was afraid of was how my death would impact those that I love. I did not want to leave people grieving or in pain. I still have things that I want to tell my sons. I still have things that I want to experience with my wife. I still have security that I need to set up for my family. I still have stories to tell with my brother, love to share with my parents, and life to live with my friends. So parents shouldn't have to bury their kids. Kids should have the lessons passed down from their parents and be well into their age before they bury their parents. But sometimes life throws you a curveball. So these are the things that I believe. So what do you do? I sat down and made a whole bunch of videos, like a whole bunch of videos. Uh, every, to everybody that I could think of. And uh, I'd, I'd be sitting there, people would walk by my office, and I'd be like sobbing in my office and in front of the camera. And uh, it seems silly, but this is my story, so I get to be silly if I want. <laughs> um, surgery, uh, I went in for surgery, <clears throat> and uh, it took a little bit longer than what was expected. It was more complex. The cancer was larger than what they expected. Uh, they sent it out to the lab for testing and came back. It was stage 3C cancer. Now, that seems bad. So I get a bit worried, and I do what, what I'm really good at. I start researching. I start going, and the first thing I start looking at is statistics, mortality rates, survivability. I can't sleep. These things are going on in my head like crazy. I'd go to bed, I'd fall asleep for two hours, I'd wake up, the whole house was silent, my mind would not stop. And uh, so I realized after a bit that studying the statistics wasn't helping me. You want to know why? Journal entry three. Because I'm an individual. I am not a statistic. Individuals determine the statistics, not the other way around. More importantly, I should be focused on researching the things that bring me hope, not the things that bring me fear. I force myself to stop looking at statistics, and I focus on things that create, for, create hope for me and a better chance for, for survival in the future. Uh, now, when I found out my diagnosis, it was hard. Not just for me, but for those people around me. Uh, I learned something that was important for me with this, which is how do you support people that have a tragic diagnosis or some huge loss in their life? So what I learned was compassion is action. It's not emotion. What I mean by that is uh, one of my challenges, one of my weaknesses, when somebody tells me something's going wrong in their life, and mentally I go through and I'm like searching for the right thing to say. I, I can't figure out what to say. And oftentimes I lose the moment. I lose the perfect time because I'm looking for the perfect words. So I, uh, during my cancer, during my entire journey, I have people that reach out to me and they express kind of this same challenge. They say, I don't know what to say. How can I help? And my response, just like everybody else, and I bet if you asked any survivor in the room or anybody, any of you that have faced anything difficult, you say the exact same thing. Oh, there's nothing you can do, but thanks for asking. If there is something, I'll let you know. And they never let you know. You know why? Because they don't know how to ask you. So here's the uh, important thing. 
various things that we can do. Kids figured this out, or at least for me, kids figured this out. One day I came home, there was this huge envelope filled with like 50 homemade cards. And uh, it was my son's school. They put together, these kids didn't know me. The, the kids had put together all these cards. They had no idea what to say. I mean, look at the card. It says, here's a cat because cats are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reading through these cards. And I mean, I am like laughing and ugly bawling because it touches, touched me so deeply. The lesson I'll take forward from there, that I'll take from this is as I move forward, when sharing my love, and sharing my concern for other people, I can't wait for the perfect words. I will hit the perfect time, and the perfect time is now. Even if I don't know what to do, I'm going to do something. So, stage three, or stage three C, cancer, means chemo. And it's called full fox, I don't care, because it's chemo, and I'm scared of chemo, like crazy scared. For a couple of days, I get stuck in my head again. Um, up until then, I'm thinking, Chemo is a contingency plan. It's the drop back and pump plan because that, that if something goes wrong with the other plan, this is what I'm going to do. I should have a plan where my body doesn't have to go through all these things. And that plan exists. I just missed it a couple of years ago because I didn't get screened. So now I'm scared. It's chemo's the main plan and I'm scared of chemo. So Kevin, a friend of mine who's here tonight, told me a story, told me a story about a woman who had chemo and her attitude about it was she was anxious she was excited about getting chemo anytime she could and she was there to get every drop because it was her it, that was her best chance of survival and i realized that the way i was thinking about this was wrong i was afraid of chemo making me sick well thing is, i'm already sick <laughs> that's <laughs> happened that shit is safe um but chemo is the enemy to my enemy it's my ally in this fight. It's an imperfect ally, but it's the best one I've got. I'll take that trade. And here's the thing. I not only needed to be willing to take the trade, but I had to have the right mindset about it. So literally, I asked every person around me, everyone around me, said, I have to change my mentality about chemo. I need you to speak positively about it. And if you hear me speaking neg negatively about it, call me out. I'm going to start being positive. I need everyone around me to be positive. It took four or five days, but I felt that fear start to go down. And I felt my, I won't say excitement because that'd be a lie, yeah. but um, I felt my willingness to take chemo um, increase. So by the time I came, went to have my first chemo visit, I was kind of looking forward to getting the ally on board. When I look back through this, I realize that through prayer and conscious decisions, um, I had a change in my attitude and a change in my fears. I wish I had had this belief pattern earlier in my life, but what I realized was nothing changed about the chemo. Nothing changed about the treatment. What changed was my vision into it, and that changed my life, changed my whole world. I wish I understood this lesson earlier in my life, that bad things are gonna happen. In my life, rain is gonna fall. My attitude about it just determines how I'll enjoy the experience, so. Uh, I wish I understood so much more of those things. Anyway, um, I'm a nerd. I think I've said that already. They put a port in my chest. I still have it. It's a bomb. They put a port in my chest so that they could put IVs in me. And that's awesome because I hate IVs. But anyway, um, I'm a nerd, so I'm thinking if they're putting a bionic in my body. I'm going to be like, is that too much? So anyway, um, I show up for chemo the very first time. I'm a little nervous. We've talked about, I get chatty and try to be funny when I'm nervous. Yeah, so it's gonna show up here. Um, first thing I ask is the obvious. You know, they, they're getting, they're prepping me and getting me ready to do my chemo. So the very first thing I ask is the obvious. It's like, guys, can you put some radioactive material in there so I can be super like Spider-Man? And they look over at me like, are you a crackhead? So, I'm not giving up on this superhero thing, come on now. So anyway, they start my IV, and uh, the nurse, well, they, they get ready to start my IV, and the nurse looks at my port, and he says, man, that looks swollen, this may be hard. And so I asked the next most obvious question, swollen, is that a fat joke? <laughs> he didn't think it was funny. Anyway, they, they get started, and uh, my port isn't working right. So to give you an idea what happens, when you go in, they take a harpoon 
connected to a hose and they jab it in your chest. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. So he's going at mine and it's not working. Now, fun fact, if you have this happen, or if, you have, if you're getting chemo, you can get lidocaine put on your chest and it will like erase any of the pain. This is not an issue. Guess what fun fact Scott doesn't know in this moment? That's it. So they go at me like two or three times. They're digging in my chest and this whole thing going on. And, uh, and I start feeling shocky. I'm like, let my pulse good, you know, get this rapid flighty pulse. I'm um, light the respirations. My vision narrows. I'm like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> and meanwhile, the nurse is like, his head's right here. He's looking at my port like, like he's Ahab and it's Moby Dick. And he's not paying attention to me. And, uh, and I'm like, oh. He's like, I just can't get this started. I'm going to go get somebody else. And I'm like, when you go, can you like get me an ice water and a cold towel for my head? And he backs up and he looks at me and he's like, oh my gosh, you don't look good. <laughs> Dude, I don't think you're supposed to say that. <laughs> so he runs off to go get me ice and seven other people. They come in the room and I'm holding my head. And I look around and I'm like, wow. I should have got popular all of a sudden. And the PA's there. She says, well, that's because you got so white. I said, oh, that is so racist. <laughs> I'm nervous. I get chatty, try to be funny. She didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> so anyway, the next guy can't start my IV. And he's digging around. He can't start my IV either. I'm getting worse. And uh, so the PA dismisses everybody. It's just her and I in the room. She says, Scott, here's what's gonna happen. You, uh, we can't start your IV. We're gonna have to cancel your chemo for today and we're gonna ask you to go to the port people and get this redone. And I said, okay. I'm sitting there and I'm sick and I'm nervous and I'm shocky. And so I muster myself up as much as I can, which isn't much at this moment, take a deep breath and I look at her and I say, no, with as much respect as I can give you, no. That's not what we're gonna do. What we're gonna do is I need you to go find the person that is best on the floor for starting an IV. I'm having a really hard time right now. I was terrified to come in. I need this to be a win. Today has gotta be a win for me. So you find your best nurse, you bring them in and they can work on me until either I pass out or they, or they win. But this is what we're doing, okay? And she pauses and she looks at me. I think she's gonna argue, but she doesn't. She walks out to go find a nurse. And while she's doing that, I'm saying prayer. One, please let this be the right choice. <laughs> Two, let them be good. So Bill comes in. He hits it just like that. So lesson learned. Two lessons. First lesson is say a prayer before I get my IVs. Second, Bill starts my IVs. That's yeah. where we are. So for me, that lesson was, it's my story. I need to be the author. Everybody else is interested in my story. I'm intimately invested. So... Anyway, um, I'm sorry. I have notes here. I should be reading. Right? So the whole ex the whole chemo experience it's really intense. Uh, I went through six months of it. Every time I went in, I'd asked if they would put something in there. Some one time it was metachlorians. For those of you that don't know that name, Jedi Knight. Um, the next it was gamma rays. So you know, oh, smash! I asked them. every time I went in, I was finding something. They I wanted to be a super. And then finally I realized that chemo had already given me some superpowers. So I was hypersensitive to cold, like crazy, crazy hypersensitive to cold. And because of neuropathy, I gradually lost feelings in my hands and my feet. I mean, like my feet, it was all, I could trip over anything. I could trip over really dense air if you give me some time. Um, I lost my energy and kind of my drive. I would talk myself out of bed. I thought it was all in my head, but I'd be like, really in bed, I'd be like, okay, move your left leg. Move your left leg, move your left leg, move your, there it goes, okay, good. Now, right leg, go with it, go with it, go, move, 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 move. That's how I would get out of bed every morning. I didn't realize until later that my wife, well, my wife told me, she's like, you do know you talk to yourself every morning, right? And I was like, I do? And she's like, yeah, at first I thought you were kind of like stroking out or something, but I figured out that she made it out of bed, which is true. So, um, another one, I had chemo brain. So chemo brain, I don't know if you know, it's like, 
I lose, I lost like 30 IQ points, which put me firmly in the negative. Um, I would start conversations in business meetings. I'd start a conversation at the beginning of the sentence. I knew exactly what I was gonna say, and at the end of the sentence, I had no clue. It'd be like, hey guys, we need to go down to the orange. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, worst superpowers ever, right? Well, the reality is, is that they're not superpowers. Every superhero has a backstory with tragedy in it. So I'm still up for this. I will tell you that my superpower that I have developed from this is compassion for other people that are going through this. There's hope for me yet though, I'm on the list. I got this awesome backstory. Anyway, um, right now I'm sitting at no evidence of disease. I'm not presumptuous enough to say that I don't have cancer. I'm, it's not in remission, but I haven't beat cancer. Um, but in the back of my head, I'm a survivor. That doesn't mean I'm over it. I don't know if I'll ever be over it. Um, I told you about tripping over things. There's still things that are going on. Every day, I, I fell. I have this huge gash scar that hasn't healed in my life. I, I uh, go through times where I can't think of things. That's why I have these awesome notes and I've lost track of what I'm thinking like four or five times just in this talk. Um, I lose balance putting my pants on. You put one leg on and you start to put the other leg on, your foot gets hooked, you can't do anything, you fall on your face. It's like a tree. It's awesome to watch, not so much to experience. But the most important thing is, I'm alive. That means I get to keep fighting every day, the best way I can. Um, so anyway, I've spoken way too long. I'm gonna say this one last thing, and then I'm gonna get out of here. Uh, lesson eight is we all need help at times, and it's okay to ask. So I have the phenomenal support of my family, my wife who became my rock, my kids who every day went out of their way to make sure that I was okay. My parents, my brother, my friends, my family, even my work. I, I, was, I, I worked through my chemo. I had my boss tell everybody, he said, hey, we, we all know that Scott is irresponsible. Now we're making it official. You can't give him any responsibilities. He's like a consultant. By the way, he's got chemo brain, so don't listen to what he says. But he gets to come to me. <laughs> so we all need help at times. Um, support is vital. It's okay to ask for help. The challenge is, is that many people don't know how to ask for help or what to ask for. Some don't even know that they need to ask. So that's why we're here tonight, for those people that can't ask or don't know to ask. Later on tonight, we're going to ask you guys to open your heart and also your wallets and uh, help them to help other people that might be going through the same fight or that are about to start it so that they don't have to go through the same things that I went through. Ramblings tonight, I really appreciate it. Hopefully something I said helped you help other people. Yes. Thank you guys.